Hi, I'm Dr. Montgomery. This is Izzy, and today we are going to talk to you about the basal angiosperms as well as the monocots. What you see in the background of this slide is corn kernels, and we will talk about corn as being an example of a monocot grain near the end of today's lecture. So we will start today by talking about the basal angiosperms. These are groups that arose before the split of the monocots and what we'll call the eudicots. And the eudicots we will talk about as being specifically the dicots that came after the split. Groups of basal angiosperms that we'll talk about include the water lilies, the laurels, and the magnolias. We'll then move on to talking about the monocots, which were one of the two major groups that occurred at the split with the eudicots. We'll talk about several unifying features that most monocots have, including their number of cotyledons, and as a clue, mono means one, so the monocots will have one cotyledon. We'll talk about their vascular bundle arrangement, which we've talked about before. Remember, it is scattered. We'll talk about their leaf vein arrangement, and when we talked about leaf veins, we already specified Monocots often have parallel leaf veins. We'll talk about their number of flower parts. We'll see its groups of three. And we'll talk about the fact that monocots typically have fibrous root structure. We'll then look at several examples. We'll sort of do a tour of the group. We will look at lilies, which you've seen many of you when you dissected flowers, you chose lilies. We'll look at agave, um, as well as orchids, banana, palms, and grass. And grass may sound uninteresting, but in fact it gives us all of the grains that we eat, and so it's an incredibly important group. To put this into some context, remember that over the last six or seven lectures, we've been going over different major plant groups. So we went over the caraphytes, which are one of the lineages of green algae, and specifically, they're the one that gave rise to all of the terrestrial plants. Then we talked about three different kinds of bryophytes, and they are all united by having a dominant haploid or dominant gametophyte generation, as well as some traits that make them um, require them to live in moist conditions, typically near water. We talked about the lycopods and the ferns, which both had separate free-living generations of gametophyte and sporophyte, but their sporophytes were bigger. And then we've been talking about the seed plants. We spent some time talking about the naked seed plants or gymnosperms, and in the, another lecture we talked about angiosperms, which have clothed seeds or seeds inside the carpal. And now with the monocots and the early angiosperms, we're obviously dissecting this group a little bit further. So here's all of those groups that we just specified. I won't go through them again. I'll just point out that the gymnosperms are the closest relative of the angiosperms. What we're going to do now is dive into this branch. Of course, this branch isn't one species. It's at least hundreds of thousands of species. And so we're going to look a little bit more closely at relationships within the angiosperms. So let's look at that phylogeny here. Remember that when we read phylogenies, things connected closer to the top are more closely related. Things that are connected closer to the bottom are more distantly related. So in the phylogeny of angiosperms, almost everything on this tree is in fact an angiosperm. Everything from right here up and over this way are angiosperms. But we put the gymnosperms on here to give us a root or to tell us sort of what's at the very base of this tree. So the next thing out would have been the gymnosperms. Within the angiosperms, what we see is that there's these two really big groups, the monocots and the eudicots. Monocots in blue, eudicots in orange. But they're not the only angiosperms. We have these lineages that split off beforehand. This is not all of them. I'm just showing you a couple of examples here. Um, there would be several more if we had a complete tree. So we are going to start talking about the early angiosperms. And we're going to start with the one that branches off 
first right here. Out of the groups we're looking at, this is the water lily. Before we talk about it specifically, let's talk about some general characteristics of these plants. These all diverged before the split of monocots and dicots. We saw that on the phylogeny we just looked at. One characteristic in common is that they, most of them have fragrance, not just in the flowers, which is common across the angiosperms, but also in the leaves, in the stems, and in other flower parts. So these are plants where if you scratch the leaf or uh, crush a leaf or crush a stem, then oftentimes there's a strong odor associated with it. The flowers are variable. We used to say that generally the early angiosperms had flowers with many flower parts, and we'll see a couple of examples that fit that pattern. However, there are other flowers that have small, or other species rather, that have small simple flowers. So it's oversimplified to say that they all have large flowers with many parts. We'll now start with the water lilies and talk about um, a few of the groups. So the water lilies are one of the earliest diverging early angiosperms. They're not true lilies, so we're not going to write the word lily on its own. Instead, we are going to combine it with the word water, so there's no confusion. Um, water lilies, as the name implies, are aquatic plants. And so you can see here, this is growing in a pool, but you'd often find them growing on ponds or lake shores or on very slow-moving rivers. Um, they can reproduce by seed, but they do also spread by rhizomes. Remember, rhizomes are underground stems. And a common characteristic of the lilies is that they have floating leaves. The leaves are usually completely round or almost completely round. And another characteristic is that they make latex. This is most obvious in their stems. So if you were to break one of the stems, you would see a white, milky, sticky substance emanate out. Um, and here is an example of how uh, water lilies have impacted our culture. So um, I apologize for my face in the background spoiling this otherwise uh, lovely painting. This is one of Monet's uh, paintings in his famous series of water lilies, um, which you can see is done in, I think, what would be called an Impressionist style. So um, water lilies are not terribly important economically. Um, if anything, they tend to clog up waterways, but they are used visually um, for their aesthetics in things like garden ponds. We are going to move on then to the next group of angiosperms, or of early angiosperms, and this is the laurel family. Now there are many plants that are called laurels that are not a member of this family, which is a little bit confusing, but things in the laurel family are all relatives of each other, and they are all early angiosperms. Um, within this family, most representatives are evergreen trees, and they are also united by having a strong fragrance. Remember that evergreen means there's no season when all of the leaves fall off. So no matter when in the year you look at the plants, there should be some leaves on it. Uh, laurels are important in parts of the tropics for forestry, um, but the place where we are going to encounter them the most is in the kitchen. And how will we do so? Well, um, many uh, very flavorful foods um, come from this family. That's not a surprise because they have a strong fragrance, as we've talked about. So the poster child for this is cinnamon, which comes from the bark of several related uh, tree species that mostly occur in India, China, or other parts of Asia. Um, and you've probably all tasted cinnamon. Additionally, bay leaves, which are pictured here, come from leaves of the bay tree, this is a tree that can grow in the upstate of South Carolina. In fact, when I need bay leaves, I don't go to the supermarket. I go over to my neighbor's yard 
and pick them off of her tree um, with permission, of course. Um, unfortunately, avocado is not a plant that will grow outside and produce fruits in the upstate of South Carolina, but it is another member of this family, and obviously it's got these large um, uh, fruits. They happen to be droops with um, quite delicious flesh, and so this is a important uh, food crop. Another group that you're probably familiar with seeing, um, certainly around campuses and maybe also in your yard, are the members of the magnolia family. So magnolias don't have much economic use in the West. They're used in some other parts of the world, a little bit for forestry and also in some aspects of Chinese medicine. But the way that we use them um, in let's say in South Carolina or in the United States, is primarily in the horticulture. So over here we have a picture of the Sweet Bay Magnolia. This is a little bit smaller than Magnolia grandifolia, the really big flowered magnolia that you might be more familiar with. Um, down here is a, another tree that grows natively. It's common in our forests in the southeastern United States. Um, however, you might not notice the flowers because this can be a tall tree and these flowers could be 60 or 80 feet above ground. So here's what the flowers on this tree would look like if you could see them. Um, they are large, um, a few inches across, and greenish um, tepals with orange at the base and many anthers. You can see for the sweet bay too, we've got a large flower several inches across, and you can see there are many anthers, although they've started to fall off here. You can also see in both of these families, the um, carpal is on this large cone-shaped structure in the middle of the flower. It's clear over here. Over here, the color is the same, so it's harder to pick out, but it goes up like this and down like this. This is really a elongation of the receptacle with many carpels attached to it. Um, so this is tulip tree, and you may remember tulip tree or liriodendron. In your king exercise, it's one of the species that is commonly included. So you might have found a twig that, if you look at my hands, had um, two bud scales that came together um, in this pattern. This pattern, which we referred to as valvate, and those twigs that we looked at were members of the uh, tulip tree uh, species. It's misspelled there. So that's going to be the end. Oh, I'm sorry. The last uh, basal angiosperm that I'll mention is the pepper vine. And we won't look at pictures of it, but I'll mention it because it's where we get our black pepper as well as things like red pepper from. This is not a relative of the bright red peppers that we use in, let's say, Mexican cooking. This is really a seed that we're eating. And I'm just mentioning it because it's another example of a basal angiosperm that has a very strong aroma. We'll now move on to the monocots. And the monocots um, are a very large group of related angiosperms. We mentioned several traits in the outline that unite them. We'll go through those in more depth now. So the first of those traits is that they have scattered vascular bundles. And this is a slide um, whose picture I borrowed from earlier in the semester, where we looked at the vascular bundles in dicots as well as monocots. And we said in the dicot there's one ring of vascular bundles and the vascular cambium in many plants that goes between the xylem and phloem, which then lets the stem widen each year by making new xylem to the inside and new phloem to the outside. We said um, when we talked about stems that monocots just have scattered vascular bundles, and an upshot of this is that they can't have a vascular cambium that constantly makes new xylem to the inside and phloem to the outside. Because as the tissue pushed out, it would be running 
into other vascular bundles that were further out on the stem. And so one upshot of this is that the die cots are going to make true wood, and it's going to be hard wood that can expand outwards each year. It's going to have rings, typically. Monocots cannot do this. Some of them have found ways to expand outwards a little bit, but they don't do it as effectively. They don't form true wood, and they don't form growth rings if they do figure out some way to expand. Another feature of the monocots is that they have fibrous root systems. So these again are images I borrowed from when we were talking about roots earlier in the semester. So hopefully some of these ideas are just review for you. And this is an onion, um, this is some sort of grass. In both cases, what we can see is that there's not one central taproot. Instead, that taproot died um, very early in development and adventitious fibrous roots formed instead. Another feature of the monocots is the one that gives them their name. This is that they have one cotyledon as an embryo when they are still in the seed. And remember that the prefix for one is mono, and cots is just short for cotyledon. So monocot literally means one cotyledon. Diagrammatically, this is what it looks like over here. You can see we've got our double integument, we've got some endosperm shown in white, and then we have the embryo itself, and this part up here is the embryonic leaf, or cotyledon, and you can see there is one of them. In a dicot, there would be two. Another feature in common with the monocots, um, this is something that you saw if you've done your flower dissections already, and that is that flower parts are in groups of three. So let's look at an example here. This is um, a iris, and an iris is in the iris family, which is a monocot family. So what we can see is that there are three petal-like sepals, um, and then there are also three petals. Here's one petal, a second petal, and a third petal back here. And then there's some weird structures in the irises that we haven't looked at. But these structures here are petal-like um, styles. And so here's one, here's one, and here's one. And the style and stigmatic tissue is actually on the underside of this, so we can't see it. So again, the important thing is that there are three of them. All of the flower parts then are in groups of three. If you've dissected the lily, you saw that flower parts were typically in groups of three as well. The next feature isn't true for all monocots, but many monocots have parallel leaf veins. Parallel means that they run more or less um, adjacent, but not touching the next the neighbors to the either side. Um, and if they do touch, it's only at the very base of the leaf or at the very apex of the leaf. In contrast, dicots typically have netted veins, where the veins constantly have subveins that are going back and forth from one. To the other. There are some monocots that have veins that are more like the netted pattern. So this isn't universal, but the parallel veins is the most typical pattern. So we're next going to look at some examples of monocots. And the first example that we'll look at here are the lilies. And the lilies include, this is the lily family. So it includes things like the day lily pictured here, this is likely what you dissected, as well as something like a tulip pictured here. Um, and if we look at the lily diagram, then just to emphasize this point, what we're seeing is three sepals. They're petal-like sepals, or tepals. Here's one, two, and three. Three petals. If you count them, you should find six anthers. There's only one style. But if you look at the very tip of this style, you can see there are 
three different stigma on it. And then down here at the bottom, let me just move this over. If you look at the ovary, you'll see that there are many ovules in long rows. But if you cut the ovary in half and look at it in cross section, you can see that there are three pairs of rows of ovaries. So six rows total, but they're in clear pairs, one, two, and three, each going down the length of the ovary. So then everything is either in threes or multiples of three. Uh, lilies are primarily used for aesthetics, so we like how they look. Um, and we plant them in gardens. They can also be used as food, and this is more common in um, other cultures than ours, and they have some medicinal uses. Our next example of a monocot is the agave, and there are many species um, in the agave genus, but one is pictured here. Um, agaves mostly grow in dry areas that are deserts or desert-like. Um, they tend to have succulent leaves. So these are thick leaves that are able to hold on to water, and they tend to have a thick waxy coating to prevent water loss. Um, the example we're looking at here is agave tequiliana, or the tequila agave, and it's obviously used that because it's used to make um, the alcoholic beverage tequila, and also some other things like syrups. Um, there aren't a huge number of economic uses for agave, but it's used as a garden plant. There are many species under cultivation for this. And one example of this, if you remember back to that video I showed you of the plant that was monocarpic, even though it lived for, for many years, we said it lived for about 25 or so years and then finally sent up a huge shoot with flowers at the top. Um, and that was maybe around our third or fourth lecture. So that plant, century plant, um, is in the agave genus. We'll move on to another example of a monocot family, and this is the orchid family. You're probably familiar with orchids. If for no other reason, um, you've probably seen flowers like this um, at the supermarket. Um, they've become very popular as we've gotten better at figuring out how to cultivate them. So in nature, many species of orchids are epiphytes. Epiphyte is literally the word or the prefix epi, which means on, and the prefix phyte, which means plant. So these are plants that grow on other plants. In other words, instead of attaching to the ground, they attach to things like trunks or branches of trees. And you can see this orchid here growing along the, a branch of a tree. Um, orchids occur in temperate areas, but they are more abundant and more diverse in the tropics. So orchids, as you saw in the last picture as well as here, have flowers that tend to be bilaterally symmetric. The left looks like the right, but the flower parts are not arranged like the spokes on the bicycle wheel. Um, the flowers have unusual structures that we won't go through, but you would have more difficulty finding things like the stigma and anthers than you would on a typical flower. Um, this right here is a lady slipper, which grows in the northern United States, but you might find lady slippers in the mountains of North Carolina. They're oftentimes rare plants. And you can see in the background of this picture the parallel leaf veins along these um, two leaves. Orchids are incredibly diverse, especially in the tropics. There are many species of them. Um, they tend to be rare plants, but um, very diverse all the same. So the next example that we are going to look at are bananas. Um, we're looking at this not because it's a huge group, but because of its economic importance and our familiarity with it. Um, so orchids have this tree-like or shrub-like growth form, 
but this is not true trees um, and it's not true wood because remember their vascular bundles don't allow for production of true wood. Now wild bananas make seeds. So the bananas we're accustomed to eating of course are basically seedless. Um, cultivated bananas do not make seeds. But this is what a wild banana looks like. So less elongate but also filled with these hard seeds that you'd have to um, spit out as you are eating. So we've already said that um, bananas have a tree-like form but not true wood. The cultivars that we use to grow bananas are seedless. That's great when we're eating bananas, but that means that it's an extra challenge to grow banana plants because obviously you can't grow them from seeds if they don't make them. So the way that we're going to grow banana plants is from things like corms, which are um, a kind of specialized stem that we haven't talked about that's going to grow near the base of the banana plants. Basically, corms would be broken off from the base here, and then each corm would be replanted, and the replanted corms would grow into their own plants. There's also some other technologies similar to that that are used to regenerate seedless, seedless bananas. We are going to move on to another tropical monocot group, and this is the palms. Of course, we do get um, some palms in the Carolinas, but we're pretty much down to one species by the upstate of South Carolina. They are more diverse in the tropics. They can include tree-sized palms as well as shrub-sized or vining palms. And just like bananas, because of the pattern of scattered vascular bundles, these cannot make true wood. And so generally what we'll see is that the palm tree, its stem is about the same width all the way from the ground up to the top of the trunk. Another repercussion of the fact that there are scattered vascular bundles is that the trunk of the wood um, of a palm tree is spongy. And this is important to South Carolina and in fact um, American history because it helped Americans win a battle at Charleston Harbor in 1776. Basically, Fort Moultrie was built out of palmetto. Um, palmetto is a kind of palm. And when the British bombarded the fort with cannonballs, then because the wood was soft, it was able to absorb the impact rather than break. And the bombardment was ineffective. Um, the British lost um, significantly more uh, men and resources during the battle and eventually retreated. And if my memory is correct, um, the Americans then held Charleston for the next four years. So this is where the Palmetto State nickname comes from and the Palmetto Palm on the flag of South Carolina. So besides its historical importance in the war, um, we use palms for a whole bunch of things. Um, it is important for food and um, we, you're probably familiar with dates, uh, which come from the date palm, and some fruits earlier in development are pictured here growing off of this palm tree. Of course, palms also give us coconut and palm oil and heart of palm, which is a little bit more rare, but something included in salads, and a starch. Um, similar to the starch that is derived from cycad stems can also be derived from palm stems and in fact they are sold interchangeably under the same labels. Of course we use palms in gardening and landscaping. If you want to make an area look vacation-y or tropical then you just plant a palm and if you're anywhere south of the Spartanburg area that palm might even look nice. The final family of monocots that we'll talk about here are the grass family. Uh, the grass family is primarily wind pollinated. So this is a case where angiosperms have reverted to what gymnosperms did, which was use wind. Because they are wind pollinated, there's no reason to make attractive um, large petals 
In fact, the petals would just get in the way of the wind. So the flowers are highly reduced. What we're looking at here is a single inflorescence from a large grass that grows on prairies called big blue stem. But this is not one flower. This is many flowers, one of which is here and here and here, 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 etc. And you can see that even though the anther, or rather the petals and sepals are not visible, you can see the stigma really clearly. The stigma is this red uh, furry thing. And you can see the anthers clearly too. Um, they're the white projections. So these are still flowers, even though they lack the showy petals and um, sepals. And grasses are incredibly important economically. Um, of course, we use them to graze various animals that we grow for food production, uh, like cows or goats or sheep. But we also eat a lot of grasses ourselves. If you say, well, I don't eat grass, it's probably you do because all of our true grains come from members of the grass family. And these comprise, in some areas, a majority of the food that somebody eats. Um, and even in other areas, it's almost certainly a plurality. In other words, we get more calories from grains than we do from any other source. Um, some examples of grains, uh, wheat is the one that we probably eat the most here. Uh, rice, we eat a lot of, and it also dominates in other cultures. Barley, we eat less of that, but of course we use it for things like brewing beer. Um, oats, we use both as a feed, and then we also eat it ourselves. Um, corn, we probably eat far more corn than we ever think about, because there are so many processed foods that have um, corn syrup as one of their main ingredients. And this list could go on and on. Um, other things that we eat that are not from the seeds. So grains, I should specify, are the seeds and some associated fruit parts from members of the grass family. But there's other grass products we eat that are not related to seeds and fruit. For example, sugarcane is our major source of table sugar. Here is sugar cane pictured here, and you can see it looks like a cane, um, and the sugar is then um, derived from inside the stems. By the way, up here, this is what wheat looks like before it's processed. So we're used to looking at wheat flour, but it's coming from something that looks very much like a seed or another typical grain. Um, bamboo, we don't eat as much of but we do eat bamboo, especially in Asian cooking. Um, and then we don't eat many grasses ourselves, but of course we do feed grass to livestock, and then many of us eat animals or consume things like dairy products, milk and cheese. Uh, grasses are also important regardless of human uses. They are dominant plants in some habitats like grasslands, from which they get their name, and prairies, and savannas, and also their components of many other habitats like forests. So this is one of the most important plant families. I'm going to end today's lecture with some final thoughts, first about how angiosperms became so diverse, and then more focused on the groups that we were talking about. So, why is it that there are so many more species of angiosperms than other plant groups? We've said in an, an earlier lecture that there are at least 10 times as many angiosperm species as there are species of all other plants combined. Well, part of the reason relates to the fact that angiosperms have flowers, and pollinators like to fly between flowers that are similar looking. So they might go from one red tubular flower to another. Why is this important? Well, what it does is it allows a plant that has, if a plant has a change, let's say a genetic change that makes its flower look different from other flowers, then pollinators are going to start flying between it and its relatives, other plants that also have the same change.
So let's just imagine that some new orange tubular flower evolves. And because this trait gets passed down to offspring, there's a whole collection of plants in an area that have this trait. If that happens, then the pollinator that goes to one of those flowers is more likely to bring pollen to other members of that group. What that means is that as that group starts to acquire new and different traits, then it's going to be able to keep those traits because it's not going to receive pollen from its relatives that have other traits. And it's also not going to give the traits to other groups because its pollen is going to get brought to other similar flowers instead of dissimilar ones. So because pollinators stay within the group, as groups change what their flowers look like, then they are able to evolve in their own direction without sharing their DNA with other members of their group. That means they are able to diversify more and more different kinds of angiosperms can evolve. So let's move on now and summarize some things about the basal angiosperms. Since these occurred before the split of monocots and eudicots, they share some, straight, some traits with both groups. In some ways, they're more similar to the monocots. Um, for example, basal angiosperms often have flower parts in groups of three, as do the monocots. In some ways, they're more similar to the eudicots. Both groups tend to have netted veins, for example. Um, focusing on the monocots, the monocots are incredibly important as food, and a lot of that comes from the overwhelming importance of grains in the grass family. Then for the monocots as a whole, they are plants that we really like to look at, and many of our house plants, as well as many of our garden plants, in fact are monocots, relatively more of them than the proportion of monocots um, in nature. So there's something about their flowers or their forms that we really like. That's all that we'll say for now about these two groups, the basal angiosperms and the monocots. When we move on, we will be talking about groups within the eudicot lineage.